as a kid, it was not okay to go play in the river. Like that wasn't something that, that kids did. And none of us learned how to swim until we left McGrath. So the river was really a barrier for me growing up. And so getting a pack raft just opened up all this terrain. And I was like, the blue lines on the map suddenly turned into trails. Like before they had been barriers and now all of a sudden they're access points. That's a huge shift. Hey everyone, Shanty here. Welcome back to episode 31 of the Out and Back podcast presented by Gaia GPS. Adventurer Luke Mel has spent decades exploring Alaska in the most creative ways. He skied from Haines to Juneau, ice skated a hundred mile route on frozen lakes and seashores above the Arctic Circle, and bike packed portions of the Iditarod Trail. In 2006, though, he discovered a much more efficient way to cover miles in mountains pack rafting. And he's taken floating down Alaskan rivers to a new level ever since. In this episode, Luke's going to take us on his incredible Alaskan journey, from growing up in a tiny landlocked village to discovering the freedom of the outdoors later in his life. Luke tells us about the Alaska Mountain Wilderness Classic, a punishing adventure race across 100 plus miles of rugged terrain, and how a tragedy in 2014 caused him to examine the risks he was taking in the backcountry. Luke tells us how he dialed it back and found inspiration to write his brand new book, The Packraft Handbook, which will be released later this month. Before we dive into this great story with Luke, though, you're going to want to do yourself a favor first and get yourself Gaia GPS. Gaia GPS is the gold standard of backcountry offline navigation tools. And regardless if you're backpacking, overlanding, mountaineering, hunting, or anything else the Wild Woods has to offer, Gaia has the maps you need, from USGS to US Forest Service to Nat Geo Trails Illustrated and literally hundreds more. And for pack rafting, you can tap into Gaia GPS's USGS Streamflows map, giving you current, current stream flow throughout the US in cubic feet per second, so you know which rivers are running and which ones are raging. Just go to GaiaGPS.com slash podcast, that's G-A-I-A GPS.com slash podcast, to snag a sweet discount on a membership. Now, on to our story with Luke Mel. I was born in Missoula, so I'm told. Um, I moved up to Alaska when I was four with my mom. And we moved straight to McGrath, which is this village on the Kuskokwim River, like a population of 500 people you have to fly into. So it was pretty pretty radical, I think, for her, for my mom to do that with two kids. Um, but, you know, again, I didn't know any better. I was little. My stepdad brought her up there. They met in Montana. He was from Montana, from the Great Falls area. He was already working there in McGrath. And then they met at like a Halloween party in Montana. And I think it was maybe six months later that she moved up. So, yeah, I'm surprised that she did that. But I'm grateful. It was an awesome place for me to grow up. When you dream of Alaska, you're probably not thinking of McGrath. A supply stop on the Iditarod Trail, McGrath sits deep in Alaska's interior. The landscape is heavily forested, flat and swampy, and the only way to get there is by plane. Or maybe dog sled. McGrath is half native. That's mostly Athabascan. And I grew up my whole life thinking like, yeah, this is the last frontier. And am and honestly, only in the last couple of years, kind of recognizing that, like, these Athabascan folks have been here for thousands of years, and it is not their last frontier. It's like their first frontier. <laughs> and so I'm kind of changing my perspective and, and learning how to how to navigate that. And And parts of what was so cool about growing up in McGrath was that we, even though we're a white family there, we did... Uh, live some of the subsistence lifestyle. And so I grew up on moose meat. Every dinner um, was moose, and that's moose that my parents hunted. I've had like 99% moose <laughs> and 1% other animals. Even like people come up to Alaska and they're psyched about the salmon, and the fish we got in McGrath wasn't very tasty. Maybe it's too far upriver. So I'm not a big salmon fan. You know, we collect our firewood. We had a dog team growing up, like a, a, a wonderful gutless dog team that was you know, outdoor dogs and we'd build a raft each each spring of firewood to harvest for the next winter and so I loved all that like 
functional, just this, these functional living skills. It's like, you need to collect the wood that keeps you warm. You need to collect the animal that, that keeps you fed. I really admire that lifestyle and I really got a lot out of it and wish I had more of that. And I don't where I'm at in Anchorage. I'm a city slicker now. Ironically, it took living in Alaska's biggest city for Luke to develop his taste for playing outside. The great outdoors around McGrath literally meant work. There wasn't any recreation for the sake of recreation. I didn't see any of that. There's nobody on skis. There was a German guy on a bike, and he was the German guy on a bike. You know, that kind of tells you something about it. When people are going outside, it's to bring something home. Berries, fish, meat, or fur. My stepdad had a little trap line. And... And I can't imagine that was lucrative for him, but that's like, that's how you go outside there. You go outside to come home with something. And, and in that case, I think he, he sort of justified coming home with Martin Pelt. So our, our recreation there was going to and from a cabin upriver. So in the summer, that's on a riverboat. And in the winter, that's on some machine or, or dog team. Luke didn't learn to ski or mountain bike or kayak in McGrath. But growing up in a small, isolated village taught him how to be self-sufficient, skills that would prove invaluable in later expeditions. I think what I got the most out of that, that living there and growing up there was getting used to things going wrong. And that's sort of my standout quality on the trips that I do now. And with my partners, they're like, well, or my wife will, you know, say like, this is the village kid. This is the village kid showing up when like a bunch of stuff goes wrong. And I'm like, we can deal with this. This is normal. This is part of the game. And I think that's just from growing up and having a sled break or trying to troubleshoot a snow machine, carburetor or whatever. And like, and seeing that as a little kid, um, my stepdad was constantly fixing everything. Everything was breaking down and everything needed fixed. And it was Sometimes you pull a snow machine part into the truck. Sometimes you pull a truck part in the snow machine. You know, it's just this really creative problem solving with the expectation that you will need to problem solve. So that served me really well for my recreational adventures. Nowadays, it seems that Luke's name is always attached to some unique Alaskan adventure. He's bike packed sections of the Iditarod Trail, skied from Haines to Juneau, and ice skated, yes, ice skated, a hundred-mile route on frozen lakes and seashore above the Arctic Circle. It's hard to believe that Luke didn't always love the outdoors. And as a boy, going outside in McGrath meant hard work. I didn't have a lot of drive to go outside there, partly because outside was hard and it was work. <laughs> so I came into Anchorage for high school. My mom did that on purpose. She thought Anchorage would be a better place for me to go to school, and that was a really good decision. I was I was super motivated academically, and McGrath wasn't a great environment to be motivated academically. <laughs> so for both my brother and I, as soon as we were ready for high school, she says, do you want to go live in Montana or do you want to go to Anchorage? Like Those were the two options. And my brother went to Montana, and, and I came into Anchorage. And in high school, I fell in with friends that were rock climbing uh, and snowboarding. And so that was my introduction to a recreational time outdoors. And each summer I was going down to visit my dad outside of Great Falls. And the highlight of those summers together was our camping trip, which was usually in the Little Belt Mountains. So he was the one that introduced like traditional camping and hiking to me. I didn't see any of that in McGrath. Um, I didn't mention it's McGrath. So it's on the Kuskokwim, so that it's swamp on either side of the river. There really isn't any way to hike if you wanted to. I mean, you can hike, but it's it's not pleasant. Like it's in a real thick forest and wet feet. So I didn't really see hiking until I was on those summer trips with my dad in Montana. So combine all those, the, some friends in high school, some very influential friends in high school, and then the little bit of the Rockies I was seeing in Montana. I really just fell in love with the mountains here in Anchorage toward the end of high school and then carried that with me through college and then a couple of grad programs. Luke studied geology at Carleton College in Minnesota and attended two graduate programs after that, one at MIT near Boston and another at the University of California. And let me tell you, he was super picky about which schools he chose to attend. 
I mean, academics were the first thing, but then as far as like, well, what am I going to do in my free time? I was looking at colleges in terms of good climbing or good Frisbee. And I chose one that had really good Frisbee. <laughs> yeah, na national champions. It was a strange, maybe a strange way to decide. That led me into grad programs in Santa Barbara and then in Boston. I was out of state for about 10 years pursuing college and grad school. But he just couldn't shake those Alaska mountains. No matter how he played it, Luke was terribly homesick. I came back every summer. I couldn't imagine not coming back. Like my heart was always in Alaska. And even when, you know, people I would date in, in college or in grad school was like, could she live in Alaska? Like that was like good and bad, right? Like maybe bad, maybe all bad, but I knew I was going to be back in Alaska. And, and actually both those grad programs, they were both PhD programs that I left early, that I left with the master's. And in both cases, I was just like, I need to get home. I was just so homesick. So I quit the Santa Barbara program, come home to Alaska, get restless, go to MIT, quit the MIT program, come home to Alaska. So there was no doubt. I knew I needed to be in Alaska. When I asked Luke why Alaska had such a strong hold on him, he paused and searched for the right words, almost as if it was too much to quantify. It's this opportunity to see raw land. And and this is a place too where I would have two years ago I would have said wilderness there. That's a great word to describe that. And I'm and I'm changing that now to wild lands. Again, because like indigenous people had been here and traveling these lands forever. And so just because they didn't leave a monster footprint everywhere they went, it's easy for us to think of it as wilderness. But that's really it. It's these these continuous tracts of wild lands that you can travel hundreds of miles without seeing a road or a footprint or a cabin. That's hugely valuable to me and to a bunch of people that it lures to the state, my friends and trip partners here. It is an incredible community. I just can't imagine being anywhere else with that combination of the landscape and the people to enjoy it with. Back at home in Anchorage, Luke started getting more and more creative with his adventures. I didn't get into the sort of ambitious adventuring stuff until I finished those grad programs and came home to Alaska. I kind of do everything that doesn't involve being airborne, uh, meaning I love all the water sports. I love being on a bike, skis, ice skates. And, and I am drawn to the paragliding that, that my friends are doing, but it, I just, boy, that seems scary. Like the risk involved in that seems too high for me at this point. Even with his feet on the ground, most people would consider Luke's pastimes risky enough, but he rejects any notion of being a dangerous thrill seeker. So it's not always about being in the middle of the woods. Part of what I'm after is the learning curve. And I didn't grow up skating. And so, so I've been on ice skates for, I've gone out every day for two months and I'm on the steep part of the learning curve and it is awesome. Like every day I go out and I'm like, I'm better than I was yesterday. And I love that. And, and I've done that with all these sports, skiing, biking, pack rafting. And I, as soon as that learning curve flattens out and I start to get a little restless. And so I'm not an expert in any of these, but I'm, I embrace learning even if it means giving up being an expert. For years, Luke's been riding that learning curve in one of the most punishing adventure challenges in the world, the Alaska Mountain Wilderness Classic. A point A to point B course, the Wilderness Classic takes participants over 150 to 250 miles of remote mountain terrain, traversing completely wild places like the Brooks Range, Wrangell St. Elias, and the Chugash. These brutal courses keep mere mortals from participating, but for those brave enough to dive in, they become part of the tight-knit Wilderness Classic community, and many get drawn in and wind up returning year after year. Luke has entered the Wilderness Classic 15 times. The Wilderness Classic, I think it's about 30 years old now, and it's a grassroots event that is organized to the degree that somebody says we're going to meet here on this date you get a starting point and an ending point and and they're typically probably 120 on the short end and 300 miles in the long end these routes that you can piece together through 
different mountain ranges. So the destination will change every three years. And it's self-supported, no sponsorship, no pickups or drop-offs. You're, you are responsible for your own rescue if anything goes wrong. And it is just an excuse to, for me, I guess, to cut some corners and see what your body is capable of traveling through wild lands. It's a little bit difficult to explain. <laughs> Though not technically a race, it's easy to get caught up in the spirit of the competition. There's some pride involved if you finish before somebody else, but it's not a formal race. And, and that's intentional in terms of the legality of traveling through, say, a, a national park or national refuge land, which, which the courses have done. I think you can't have like a competitive race in, an Arctic, in, a, in a national refuge, but maybe you can have a group of people traveling through it. So that's why it's more of an event than a race. But but yeah, the times that I finished first have felt awesome. And I'm like, wow, I can't believe I finished first. That is so cool. But then I'm not going to go and blast it all over social media that I won something. And in general, that's what the whole community is doing is is the support you would get from somebody if you if you needed help. Like absolutely they would they would help you rather than than work toward their own goal. And for most people it does feel like a very personal goal like I want to try doing this summer route without a sleeping bag, or I want to try this winter route without a tent. And you've got just enough of a safety margin. You're traveling with some partners, you've probably got people ahead of you, people behind you, that it makes it a little more comfortable to, to cut those corners and see what you can get away with. But really, Alaska in the winter without a tent? I think what's missing is the, like, why? So why are we doing this? And I love learning. I mentioned that earlier. I've never learned as much as I learn on these courses, especially in the first years that I was doing them. Like the learning density is maxed out. And that's why I'm willing to go, you know, like first year I show up and I'm like, these guys don't have tents. That is insane. And so I do the course, you know, I carry my tent, whatever. And I learned a ton and I think, oh, I could have cut this corner. I didn't take care of my body. I brought the wrong food. On that one, actually, I had read that, that Andrew Skirka takes off all of the packaging on his bars. He eats bars and he takes off the packaging. So I'm like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. If, if Andrew does it, I'm going to do it. And so I, but I went one step further and I put all of my food in one Ziploc bag, like breakfast, lunch, dinner. It's all smashed in there together. And then I discovered there that, you know, I had some, I don't know, maybe a, like a, a cherry in a trail mix that sort of leached out its cherryness. Somehow I couldn't eat that stuff. Like the, it was too sugary or something and it wasn't contained in its nice little package because I, I was trying to do what Andrew does. And, and so I wasn't able to eat a lot of that food and I lost eight pounds in four days, like major. And I was wrecked at the finish. And then I, and I said, I'm never going to do this again. And then two weeks later, I thought, well, but what if I'd brought the right food? You know, what if I'd been able to eat 4,000 calories a day? And so it could, it could be food or it's like next year, it's like, well, yeah, I don't need a tent. Or next year, yeah, I, I don't need a sleeping bag. And, and cutting those corners and just learning what our bodies can do, that is so empowering. There are few rules in the Wilderness Classic. But one unnegotiable rule is that travel has to be human powered. It's been hiked, biked, skied, and even paraglided. Pack rafts have always been in the picture. It's an inflatable boat. And, and the, I think that term pack raft just refers to it being light enough that you're willing to pack it, that you're willing to put it in a backpack, as opposed to, say, an inflatable kayak, which would maybe weigh even 15 pounds, 20 pounds. I'm not going to carry that on a backpacking trip. But a six-pound boat, yeah, especially if that will gain me 20 miles where I can float downriver instead of hiking. I think I got my boat around 2007, and that was after a year of borrowing uh, friends' boats. And really, it was just seeing them do hiking trips where they got to float out instead of flying out or float in instead of flying in or cross some heinous river that I can't cross without a boat. So it was, it was really just by seeing those examples that I thought, huh, maybe this is something I should get into. And at that point, everybody in the classics was using them. So that was my model. And as the boats have developed and as the market has grown, um, there are now boats that are capable of class five, you know, very difficult water. 
when I got into the sport, the the people that were drawn into it were backpackers like me. You know, it's like I am a hiker and I want to extend this hike, and this is a tool that I can put in my pack, just like a sleeping pad, just like a tent, an accessory for a hike. Like, how cool is that? So the market and the intentions for the boats have have evolved a bit since I've been watching. the The design has evolved to, to the point where they're they are very capable boats. Um, the early boats were were simple designs, easy to build, um, cheaper to produce, and easy to swamp, easy to capsize. And the newer boats are playful. You can carve them. You can get them up on edge. You can huck waterfalls. So I think that's part of it. And then I think the other part is just awareness that these things exist. It was a pretty niche market. They were popular in Alaska before they became popular in the Rockies. And that's part of that was because there is so much water that's hard to access. But now in the Rockies, it's like, yeah, I've got this thing in the back of my, my car. Like, let's, let's go paddle across this lake to go fishing, to go hunting, to run a rapid, whatever. Pack rafting pulled Luke in all the way, and soon he was using the river to get all around the backcountry of Alaska. A late swimmer in life, Luke had to acquaint himself with fast-moving water. I had no boating background. I, Even though I grew up on the Kuskokwim there and we, we had a river boat, it's cold and it's muddy, it's murky, and it's swift. And like as a kid, it was not okay to go play in the river. Like That wasn't something that, that kids did, and none of us learned how to swim until we left McGrath. So the river was really a barrier for me growing up. And so getting a pack raft just opened up all this terrain. And I was like, the blue lines on the map suddenly turned into trails. Like before they had been barriers and now all of a sudden they're access points. That's a huge shift. And pack rafts have changed my ability to to explore more than anything else. And honestly, I think Guy is number two on that list And, and that combination pack rafts and then being able to look at at satellite imagery just completely changed the game for me. Anyone can sit in a boat and paddle it, but to master pack rafting requires a level of dedication. Dedication that Luke sort of skimped on when he first started doing it. It is very easy to get into pack rafting. It means owning a boat and sitting in it. So that's great. Check. The hard part is maybe doing it informed and doing it safely and this is really where where my evolution i'm basically using the mistakes that i made in this learning process to try to keep people safe at this point as a hiker for you to get into pack rafting you would probably do what i did which is you would pack raft like a hiker which means you'd see that blue line and say this is my trail and you'd paddle straight down the river to go from the start of your trail to the end of the trail. Uh, You're just like, these are my tennis shoes, and I'm just going to run down the river, straight down the river. And and that's great. Nothing wrong with that. Except that, like, if you're on a trail run and something goes wrong, you you stop running. Or if you're on a bike, you, like, hit the brakes. If you're on a ski, you snowplow. And in the water, you can't do that. You don't control the medium. And so if you're drifting toward a log you're going to drift toward that log. And and it requires a pretty major like mental shift to acknowledge that you don't have control over the river because we do have control over all of these other mediums that we play on. So my evolution in pack rafting was to, to just gun down things like a hiker. And I loved it. It's super fun. And I felt very accomplished and say, I did it. I got through class three section of water. Maybe I'm ready for class four and I'd get on a class four section of water. I'd get through it and then congratulate myself on getting through it. But I was getting through those difficult sections of water without without the skill set to actually control my position in the water, if that makes sense. Like it's one thing to get through. It's another thing to have control. And you need that control, say, to help a friend if they're in trouble. Or you come around the corner and there's a log jam, you need control to get to shore. In 2014, tragedy struck on the Alaskan Mountain Wilderness Classic. Luke's friend, Rob Kerr, died on the course in a pack rafting accident. 
Though Luke wasn't there when it happened, he had been traveling with Rob earlier in the course before pulling away at a faster pace. Rob's death shook Luke to his core. The transition, that mental transition for me, was a rude awakening when a friend died on a wilderness classic. And we had been traveling together at the start of the classic, and we floated down the Copper River together. It's awesome, huge river system. And then I joined up with some other friends that were moving a little faster. The, some, you know, on these classics, some of the partnerships are kind of fluid and, and travel with some guys and then switch off, travel with some other guys. So that's what I did. And we finished our course. I got back home and I got a message that Rob was missing, that he capsized from his boat and they hadn't found his body. And so then I helped coordinate that rescue effort that involved eventually involved the, the Air National Guard doing a body recovery. And, and Rob and I, we weren't real close, but we, we have been doing these classics and showing up twice a year and seeing each other and appreciating each other. And we had this great faux rivalry where I was at a phase in my evolution where I was cutting every corner and going as light as possible. And we'd, we'd do a winter route and I'd ask my partner, like, do you think we need crampons? And they say yes. And I say, well, let's just bring one pair so we can each have one crampon. And and so this like ultralight extreme, and Rob was on the other other end of that, and I and I teasingly called him Team Heavy because he'd bring comforts and he'd bring backups. He'd have we did this one that we did together. I didn't I didn't I was running cold, and he said, oh, "I've got an extra spare of long johns. You want to take my long johns?" Like I don't want to take your spare long johns. What if you get cold? And he's like. No, these are my spare, spare long johns. I've got an extra pair for me, but I've also got this extra, extra pair. <laughs> so he gave me his extra, extra pair of long johns. So we, you know, we'd show up to these events and talk shit to each other about like, hey, what, you know, what are you going to saw in half for this trip? That's what he'd tell me. And and say, so like, you know, one year he he forgot to take a snow machine repair kit out of his backpack. So he's carrying a wrench and a spark plug on one of these. Sometimes they'd have a beer in there, you know. So we had this great, we had this great camaraderie, and we we shared this deep respect for Alaska's wilderness and deep respect for these these classics and and what they allowed us to do. It was literally part of his wedding vows that it was okay for him to keep doing these classics. That it meant that much to him. It was tragic. Rob was around and, and we, you know, he was pack rafting like a hiker, just like me. He, we, we cut the same corners. He wasn't wearing a dry suit. I wasn't wearing a dry suit. It's like, that's a four pound penalty. And we're doing, we're trying to cover 40 miles a day. Uh, no helmet. Yeah, of course not. So we were cutting those same corners and he was a friend and somebody I respected. And, and that just rattled me. It just, it forced me to reevaluate what the hell I'm doing playing outside every weekend, doing, you know, going into the middle of the mountains without a tent, without a seat bag, without a dry suit. And and then it forced me to recognize the, the power of the river, the force of the river. The river doesn't give a damn that I got through that rapid. Rob walked around this canyon, this canyon of class four rapids. Like he did the risk assessment. He and his partner, Greg, they were like, no, we know we're not Class four boaters, let's walk around that, we'll put in below it. And that's what they did. And then he still got tripped up on some some weird hydraulic feature. The loss of Rob forced Luke to take a long, hard, and honest look in the mirror. I just scaled everything back. And I and honestly it was timed a little bit. Like that that was kind of the phase of my life where I was pushing the hardest and I was closest to that, to the edge of my risk tolerance. And, and was having close calls, you know, buried in an avalanche, starting an avalanche, snow blindness, like a bunch of things are going wrong. And I just, I, it was obvious like, yeah, dude, you got to step back. And so I did. So I, I stopped adding class four water and I went back to class three water and I said, do I have control? Like, can I catch that eddy? Catching an eddy on a river is the most basic foundational skill in pack rafting or any whitewater sport like kayaking or canoeing. An eddy is just this, like a safe pocket. It's like a shadow, maybe behind a rock where you've got fast water going down the river, but that water is deflected around the rock. And so the backside has this little calm safety zone. You can just literally get in there and hang out. 
and catch your breath, look down river, get out of the river if you need to. To be honest, I spent years paddling class four water without without being able to catch an eddy. And that is basic, basic functionality for anybody that's on a class three river, a river with any difficulty. Like you gotta know how to catch an eddy. And I didn't. And I got away with it. And so did my partners. And Rob didn't. So what's the difference? Luke searched for an answer. Why Rob and not him? We can make the wrong call over and over again and things work out. And it's this positive reinforcement. Things work out. I got this. I'm fit. I'm well fed. I have the right gear, whatever. Like it works out, it works out, works out uh, until it doesn't. And it's not like there was one bad decision. This is true in Avalanche Terrain. This is true in Rob. Like he didn't make one bad decision. Where they put decided to put in the river, that was not the mistake. It was a bunch of little decisions that were right at the time, probably. You know, it's like, um, I'm not going to take a swift water class because it costs $400. I'm not going to bring a dry suit because it's four pounds. I'm not going to sleep because I'm in the middle of the wilderness classic. I'm not going to eat enough because, and again, it's a weight penalty. All of those little decisions just push you. I call it, it's called safety drift. They push you into this position of being more exposed and more vulnerable when something goes wrong. If Rob had, had taken that same swim on day one of the classic, maybe he would have recovered. You know, he's, he'd be alert. He's, he's got still got the pizza in his belly from the night before or whatever. If Rob had been wearing a dry suit, like maybe that would have made the difference. It would have been so easy for Luke to give up on pack rafting after Rob's accident. Instead, he dove deeper into the sport. I think what kept me in in the water and interested in improving was again, my inclination to get on that learning curve. And, and this was an opportunity for me to learn how to do it right. Like I was doing it, I was pack rafting, but I wasn't doing it right. And so I stepped back, I got on less difficult water and I focused on technique and control. And I sought out mentors and I sought out the Swiftwater Rescue Training. And that course was awesome. I was just, wow, you know, it just really boosted my confidence and, and gave me a sense that I that I could learn how to respond. Like the, the game is to identify what can go wrong and then to train to know how to respond when it does. Because something is going to go wrong. Like we're exposing ourselves to risk during all of these sports. And, and that's because we get a reward out of it. That reward is really important to a lot of us. So there's going to be some risk. Something is going to go wrong. Hopefully it's a little thing. Usually it's a little thing. But this was an opportunity to, to do it right. And and so I just reset the clock. And I worked on technique. And I loved what I learned. And I learned about rivers and how they work. And I loved that. And I started teaching the safety content because that just felt like a way to kind of salvage to get something positive out of Rob's loss, like to not have that be for nothing. And that all evolved into me wanting to create a, a resource for people, a written resource about exactly this, like what can go wrong and how do I train to respond when it does. And so that's what's turned into this the Pack Raft Handbook. And it's due out in the end of May, which I'm, which I'm really excited about. It kind, of, kind of feels like the culmination of my adult life, honestly. Like it's been a huge project and it incorporates so much of what I've learned in the last 15 years. Luke poured all his knowledge into the pack raft handbook. Risk assessment, gear, reading water, river hazards, and trip planning. It's all in there. Luke reminds us that, though it takes time to develop the right skills to be competent and safe on moving water, it's so worth it. Rivers are beautiful and pack rafting is fun. My favorite trips are where you hike and then you float and then you hike and then you float and you're just alternating what muscle group is worn out and you're letting the other one recover. Then part of what I discovered in whitewater where you realize this is fun on its own accord. Running rapids is fun. This is, this is no different than being a biker. So say you bike commute to work and you're like, this bike is great at getting me to work. And then at some point you get that bike on a banked corner on a bike trail and you're like, whoa, what was that? Or you get a little bit of air, you know, and you're like, wow, that was fun. And, and you can appreciate that same bike for its 
it's it's bikeness. Like it's not just a transportation of uh, device. It's like biking itself is super fun, and and paddling rivers itself is really fun. It is fun to carve into an eddy. It is fun to get on a tongue and ride through all this gnarly noise that's on your right and on your left. But you're just surfing this like magic carpet ride through these rapids. So so that's where. For people like me, you can get really drawn into the reward of learning about water and how it works, and and how to navigate river features. That's been really rewarding. Thanks for joining us, Luke. To learn more about Luke, visit his website at thingstolukeat.com, thingstolukeat.com. His website has all kinds of great tips for pack rafting, including trip planning and trip reports. And also, when you're there, you can pre-order a copy of his brand new book, The Pack Raft Handbook, which is a definitive instructional resource for pack rafting. And of course, we'll make sure to include links for all of this in our show notes. Also, be sure to check us out on Instagram at Out and Back Podcast. If you like today's show, you can either send me and Mary flowers and pizza, or you can leave us a nice five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And I must say, while I appreciate flowers and pizza, I always enjoy a good five-star review even more. And then finally, head on over to GaiaGPS.com slash podcast to get that great discount on the gold standard of offline backcountry navigation tools. I'm Shanti, along with Mary, and we'll see you next time on the Out and Back podcast presented by Gaia GPS. Take care, everyone.